Thanks for joining us once again, friends, as we cover this eight-part series entitled The Two Mysteries Collide. Today, we'll be covering part five, in which we cover the subject, the unleashing of opposing spirits. As we study this topic today, let's just do a recap before we move into this new section. So, so far, we've covered the mystery of godliness incarnate, and we saw that that was manifested in Jesus Christ. He came to this world, divinity united with humanity to reveal the glory of God, the character of God, God's redeeming love towards humanity. And in light of doing this, he wanted that revelation of God's redeeming love, the, the mysterious love of God that is revealed in the gospel, and that is the gospel. Friends, he wanted that mystery to continually be revealed, but now through the channel of his second body, the church. The church being the instrumentality to communicate to men and women all over the world the character of God. But friends, we saw that while this is the work of the mystery of iniquity, in also not showing it in Jesus, not only showing it in Jesus Christ, but also being revealed in the body of Christ, the church that this mystery produces. Friends, we saw that there is an antagonistic power working opposite to the work of the mystery of godliness, and that is the mystery of iniquity itself. So you have these two mysteries at work, both producing a church. And friends, you have the mystery of godliness producing a church, and then you have the mystery of iniquity also producing a church as well. And we saw that the church that is produced by the mystery of godliness is all those that are called out from the world. Even in the Old Testament, God had those who He had called out of the world, but we were starting especially from apostolic times. As Jesus started the New Testament church, that New Testament church went from that time all the way through the Dark Ages, the 1,260 years of prophecy, of Bible prophecy that is covered in multiple places in Scripture, in Daniel and in the Revelation. And we saw then at the close, just before the close of time, God will continue that manifestation of the mystery as He has done it through the church. He will now continue to manifest it in the church, but in the form of the final remnant at the end of time. And we saw that that remnant is none other than the Seventh-day Adventist movement. But it's not just that. We also saw that the mystery of iniquity produces a church, and I would dare say even churches. We saw that the mystery of iniquity produced the falling away, which led to the ultimate formation of the papacy, the papal system. And then at the end of time, the papacy would grow in the sense that the other Protestant movements would unite with the papal agenda and actually seek to exalt the papacy. We saw that the way that this would happen is specifically through the medium of Christianity within the United States. We saw that the first beast of Revelation 13 is none other than the papal system, and we saw not only is the first beast the papal system, but we also saw that another beast would rise up to exalt the papal system once again in its power. For you remember, in 1798, that power was interrupted. It lost the civil power and the ability to enforce its dogmas upon the masses. So with that loss now, another nation rises up in Bible prophecy. We found out that that was Christianity, Protestantism, apostate in its form in the United States of America, would rise up to exalt the way that the papacy worked, which is by uniting church and state, and out of that union would come ultimately what we saw is the Sunday law, Sunday legislated. And so as these things happen, friends, this is now where we are going to continue. Because how does it get to the point where Protestantism apostate in its form will be able to exalt, take hold of the civil power, and through this work, exalt the papal system once again. How does that happen? Friends, we are going to go into that today. Let's have a word of prayer as we commence. Father in heaven, I pray that as we go into this subject, that you will strengthen our hearts and minds to receive the truth as it is in Christ, as it is revealed in the Word. 
Illuminate our minds. Lord, may I not be seen. Forgive me of my transgressions and use me as a vessel that, Lord, your word, your truth for this time might be communicated. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles with me, go with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 13. We're going to Revelation chapter 13. We've unlocked verses 1 and 2, but I want to read something to you in verses 13 and 14. Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, to show us how the, this nation will come to a point where there will be set up an image to the beast, the uniting of church and state, which means the loss of religious liberty, and ultimately then through that union of church and state, the ultimate passing of a Sunday law. How will this happen? Verses 13 and 14 of Revelation 13 tells us this, and he, speaking of Protestantism within the United States of America, it says, He doeth great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now I wonder, what is the result of something this miraculous being done, fire falling from heaven? Verse 14 tells us, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them, in light of this miracle, that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, meaning the wound by the civil power, and did live. Do you see it? So friends, it's as a result of verses 13 and 14 that the image of the beast is then set up. Through this miracle of fire falling from heaven along with a series of other miracles, friends, it will be so intense, the power and the demonstration of these miracles will be so great that it will result in the people moving for the actual image of the beast to be set up. And the result of that will be the mark of the beast as we know. So in light of looking at this now, this is crucial for us to remember as we look at this. We're seeing here, what we're seeing here is that Christianity is able to set up an image to the beast because, and here's what we're going to see here, is because of a false revival. How do we know this? Let's continue. I want us to look at something here as it concerns these miracles, but before we get into the miracles and what this passage in Revelation 13 and verse 13 symbolizes, I want us to look at the work that will take place behind those miracles that cause the miracles and as a result leads to deception. Two places I want us to go in in Scripture. First is 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel chapter 28. We're going to look at the reality that while, yes, God works powerful miracles, and He will do powerful miracles in these last days, at the same time, the devil and his fallen angels can also work miracles, just as God and His angels can. One will do miracles for the sake of drawing men and women to the truth, and one will do miracles for the sake of drawing men and women to deception, to error. And so let's look at this understanding of the work of evil angels and of good angels in the Bible. As we see this, friends, I pray that these things will make sense to each and every one of us. Because what we're going to see here is going to blow our minds as it concerns how the enemy of souls works and how God works and why this work will climax at the end of time. So in 1 Samuel chapter 28, and let's look at verse 7. This is Saul now, speaking of Saul and his desperate situation and wanting to hear the voice of God. Samuel is dead by this time, and he wants to be led by God. But in light of his rebellion and his jealousy, he cannot hear God's voice. God is not speaking. And so what does he do? He resorts to the ultimate form of apostasy in going to a witch. It says in verse 7, Rather than turning to God according to what is revealed in His Word, listen to what he does. Verse 7, Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her. This is verse 7 of 1 Samuel 28. And inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit. 
And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirits, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto you. And the woman said unto him, apparently by some way, shape, or form, she knew that this was an Israelite coming to her, because in verse 9 it says, And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul had done, how he had cut off those that have familiar spirits, and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? This is some deep stuff, because Saul had vanquished, he had, he had put out of the kingdom all those who had been consulting spirits, friends, all those who had been consulting mediums, all those who had been consulting, who had been involved in witchcraft, in spiritualism. Friends, this is some intense stuff. That means whatever familiar spirit this woman was communicating with, it wasn't the Spirit of God. It wasn't holy angels. Friends, it had to be, even right off the bat, we can see that it had to be fallen angels. Whatever would be consulted, it would not be of God. Now it continues by saying here, And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto you? And he said, Bring me up, Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For you are Saul. So this means the disguise was so intense that Saul had in this, in this particular story that even though she recognized that whoever was coming to her was an Israelite, she could not recognize exactly who this Israelite was. But once this evil spirit perceived to be Samuel came up, there was a clear realization to this woman that this was King Saul coming to her. And so friends, in light of this work, in light of this, this thing that scripture is laying out before us, we're realizing that, whoa, okay, the woman comes to an understanding that this is King Saul. Now in verse 13, it says, and the king said unto her, be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Notice this is not something coming down from heaven. It's ascending up out of the earth. And she said, I saw gods. It says in verse 14, And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul, not that it was Samuel, but Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. Friends, this is a powerful story that we're reading because it's showing, it's one of the major instances in which we see the work of fallen angels and their abilities. The ability that this angel had, this fallen angel had, we know that this is a fallen angel because the Bible tells us that the dead know not anything. So who was this woman communicating with being a witch? Friends, it could not be God and it could not be holy angels. The only option we have left is that this is the manifestation of a fallen angel personating Samuel himself. And so we see here that one of the prerogatives of even evil angels is the ability to personate the dead. And so as this is manifested now, what we're going to see here is that it's not only the ability of fallen angels to do this, but friends, unfallen angels have the same ability. Do you know that? In the book of Daniel chapter 9 and verses 20 and 21, we see there in context that Daniel has just been given an understanding, a little bit of revelation as it concerns the 2300 year prophecy in the book of Daniel chapter 8. But as a result of this, he's left with a certain 
uh, he, he, there's certain things that he doesn't understand. And as a result of not understanding those things, Daniel even falls sick. And so he's trying to understand the truths that concerns his people and that concerns the future. And in light of this, God says, I'm going to come back. I'm going to send my angel back to help him to understand more. Concerning the 2300-year prophecy delineated in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, God wants to help him to understand more of that prophecy and when it begins. And so what happens? Gabriel comes in Daniel chapter 9. And in Daniel chapter 9, as Gabriel comes back, he comes to break down the beginning of the 2300-year prophecy by another time prophecy that is connected to the Jewish nation. And so look at what happens in Daniel chapter 9 in verses 20 and 21. It says there, as Gabriel comes back, look at how it describes him as he comes back to help Daniel further understand the prophecy. It says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, this is Daniel, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of God. Look at what it says here. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation or the time of the evening sacrifice. Friends, what are we seeing here? Gabriel, when he comes, how is he described? As the man Gabriel. So when Gabriel comes to Daniel, what form does he take on? He takes on the form of a human. So therefore, what are we seeing here? We're seeing that evil angels, according to the story with Saul, evil angels have the ability to do what? They have the ability to personate the dead, personate human beings that were once alive but are now in the grave, and then also holy angels, according to Daniel chapter 9, have the ability to personate human beings as well. The difference is one personates human beings for the purpose of deception, and the other personates human beings, not the dead, but they take on human form for the purpose of revealing truth. This is the distinction between holy and unholy angels, holy and evil angels. One comes in human form for the purpose of deception. The other comes in human form for the purpose of revelation, the revelation of truth. Now, what we're going to realize is that evil angels are behind this work that we just read about at the beginning of this presentation in Revelation chapter 13, this major work of fire falling from heaven, which we're going to find out, which basically, as I'm going to say at this moment, is a manifestation of a false revival. How do we know this? You remember in one of the presentations before, I mentioned that out of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, over 270 of them are taken from somewhere else in the Old Testament and certain aspects and certain parts of the New Testament are alluded to in the book of Revelation. So what we are seeing here, friends, is that in the book of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 13, it is an allusion to previous stories in the Bible. Stories in which fire fell from heaven, not as judgment, but as a medium to draw people. And friends, we have two instances in which that happened. The story, I'll reference it in 1 Kings chapter 18, in which you had the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And you remember what happened in that showdown. In that showdown, as the prophets of Baal called on Baal to pour out the fire upon their sacrifice, nothing happened. But as soon as Elijah called upon the Lord, fire fell from heaven and devoured the sacrifice that Elijah had set up. And so in light of that, once that happened, the people that were in apostasy turned to the Lord and said, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. So they acknowledged Jehovah as the supreme ruler of Israel and as the only ruler of Israel. Friends, that day a revival took place. Of course, it was short-lived, but a revival began that day as a result of the work that took place with Elijah 
on Mount Carmel and God pouring down the fire. Therefore, we see the pouring out of fire connected to the people turning back to Jehovah. Now, in connection with this, we see the same thing in the New Testament. Fire falling on the day of Pentecost. As the apostles prepared themselves for the reception of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit finally came and was poured out, friends, it was poured out as tongues of fire on the heads of the disciples. They were empowered to then give the message to the then known world. And 3,000 in that very day accepted the truth of Christ dying for them, Christ resurrected, and Christ ascended and Christ soon to come. Friends, as this happened, a revival took place. Therefore, fire falling from heaven is connected to the understanding of a revival. However, in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 13, this is a false revival because in verse 14, we see that men are deceived as a result of this. So these signs and wonders, friends, that will be accomplished leading to this false revival, will lead the world into further apostasy, starting here in the context of Revelation 13 and verse 11 onward, starting right here within the United States of America, and then spreading forth from here to the rest of the world. Now, who's behind this revival? I want to read to you here these two statements. One is found in the Signs of the Times, August 26th, 1889. Friends, what we're going to realize is that evil angels are behind this revival, causing these signs and wonders and bringing it before the people. It states in the Signs of the Times, August 26, uh, um, 1889, the year 1889, it says, It is Satan, speaking of the ability of fallen angels to personate the dead, it says it is Satan's most successful and fascinating delusion. One calculated to take hold of the sympathies of those who have laid their loved ones in the grave. Evil angels come in the form of those loved ones and relate incidents connected with their lives and perform acts which they performed while living. In this way, they lead persons to believe that their dead friends are angels, hovering over them and communicating with them. These evil angels who assume to be the deceased friends are regarded, look at this, with a certain idolatry. And with many, their word has greater weight than the word of God. Now, a following statement that is in connection with this is also found in early writings. Page 87, and it goes as follows. The saints must get a thorough understanding of present truth. So this is speaking to us. This is speaking, I would say, let's say to Seventh-day Adventists, to those who know the truth concerning the state of the dead. But it's not that just we must just know this truth. Listen to what the statement says. The saints must get a thorough understanding of present truth, which they will be obliged to maintain from the Scriptures. They must understand the state of the dead. Why? For the spirits of devils will yet appear to them, professing to be beloved friends and relatives, who will declare to them that what? Look at this. You want to see how the mark of the beast will be instituted? These fallen angels will declare to them that the Sabbath has been changed. Also other unscriptural doctrines. Friends, this is solemn. This is how the image of the beast is set up, and this is how the mark of the beast will ultimately be set up. Why? Because behind the work of this false revival, evil angels will be at work, working signs and wonders, but how will they appear? Friends, we're realizing that based on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, they will appear appear as departed loved ones, friends. As departed loved ones. This is how they will appear. And when they appear in this false revival, working signs and wonders, what will these evil angels say appearing as departed loved ones? They will say that the Sabbath is Sunday. Not only that, as we read here, they would say that the Sabbath has been changed. And so in light of the word of these fallen angels having greater weight 
than the Word of God Himself. Friends, people will then begin to think, we must set up this Sabbath and we must cause it to be legislated. Great Controversy, page 591 states, communications from the spirits will declare that God has sent them to convince the rejecters of Sunday of their error, affirming that the laws of the land should be obeyed as the law of God. They will lament the great wickedness in the world and second the testimony, here it is, here's how we know Christianity is involved, they will second, these fallen angels will second the testimony of religious teachers that the degraded state of morals in society is caused by the desecration of Sunday. Great will be the indignation excited against all who refuse to accept this testimony. Do you see how persecution comes back again at the end of time? Friends, it is because of the work of fallen angels appearing to men, seconding the very testimony and word of, of fallen angels, friends, or fallen or ministers that have apostatized from the truth. Friends, this will lead to the great error of setting up Sunday and setting, up as, setting it up as a law. Now, friends, in light of this, as we look at this, we're going to read and look at another statement here. Now, the question is that this happens, but the question that we want to understand here, the, the thing that we want to ascertain or come to an understanding of is why would the enemy of souls set up this false revival? Why would he want to set it up in the first place? Friends, the reason is this. The reason he sets up a false revival in Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, is because in Great Controversy, page 464, paragraph 1, we read the following. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work and before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be a great religious interest. Do you see that? Evil spirits will be at work giving their false messages, producing the sense of a revival because of the coming outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They will do this work beforehand, which produces a true revival and the message of the loud cry. This final outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the message which that outpouring will produce is found in Revelation, in all, um, in all of Revelation 18. But for the purpose of our study, we will focus on just the first few verses of Revelation 18, the first four to be specific. So let me break that down again as, as we're looking at this concept. Friends, what will happen is that the devil does this false revival that we're looking at in Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, accompanied with these major miracles. He will do this work through the instrumentality of his fallen angels to deceive the people, and that as they are deceived by these miracles put on by fallen angels, appearing as departed loved ones, as these miracles happen, attending these miracles will be false doctrine because as these angels appear and their word holds more weight with the people than the word of God, they will then begin to say the reason for the state of society and the declining of morality in society. The reason for this is because Sunday has been desecrated. 
Therefore, the church and state will come together to pass laws to remove the desecration of Sunday and to place it on such a pedestal that those who will not worship on that day, friends, will suffer major penalties. This false revival happens and causes all of those things as its ripple effect. Now, why is it caused? Why does this happen, I should say? This happens because there's a true revival that the devil knows is coming. And so in light of that true revival, he brings a false revival to, to steep the people in such deception that when the true revival comes, they will not accept it. Friends, this is how much the devil hates God and humanity, that he will seek to seal men in apostasy. So when that time comes, the people will not be ready. So as we look at this, go with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 18. We're going to Revelation chapter 18 in our Bibles, Revelation chapter 18. And this is what it states here. Revelation chapter 18, and this is what it states. This is where we see delineated the manifestation of the true revival. Now remember, angels and Bible prophecy we saw can represent literal angels. But depending on the context, it can also represent a movement of converted humanity that God uses to communicate His message of salvation. And in this case, in Revelation 18, the latter is the reality, that this is a symbol of a movement in the end of time, the continuation of the final movement that we spoke about in our previous presentation. So as this happens, one of the important things for us to realize is this angel, unlike the previous three, Let's read this. I, I want to read it to you, and then I'll come back to this major point that I want us to see here. Look at this angel. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1, this is what it states there. It says, And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Do you see that? So this angel descends from heaven, and the earth is lightened with this angel's glory. It has great authority, and the world is lightened with this angel's glory. So this angel, unlike the previous three that we covered in chapter 14, the three angels that we covered there, unlike those three angels, this angel is not flying in the midst of heaven, but rather it comes down from heaven to the earth, meaning that this will be the most practical message ever given leaving men and women without any excuse. The previous three messages were practical, but the additional power of this fourth angel climaxes that practicality. It reveals this powerful revival that takes place among God's people, and as a result, the movement becomes so practical in the way that it operates that it leaves the world without excuse. This is how serious this thing is going to get, friends. And so let's break this down. Let's break down an understanding of the work of this angel, which is a symbol of the final revival that will take place in the final remnant. This is what it states here. So let's look at it again. It says that the angel has great power. The word there is exousia. That's the Greek word, meaning actually authority. Now, what is this authority that this angel has, this movement will have? Remember, the movement comes down from heaven, meaning this movement, these messengers of the last days, will be heavenly ordained. They will be in heaven, a heaven ordained movement, a movement of heavenly origin, even while existing on earth. And so, what is the authority of this movement? In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 29, it shows us what the authority of Christ was. What caused the people to perceive Him as one with authority? It says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 29, For He, Jesus, taught them, the people, as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, what made the difference? What was the tool that Jesus was using that caused the people to see Him as one with authority? Friends, the major tool that He was using without shame, would surprise us. 
it was none other than the Word of God. Hence it says, for he taught them as one having authority. So he thought he taught the people the Word of the living God. He broke down the principles of Scripture. Unlike the scribes and the Pharisees, who resorted more to tradition, uncertain traditions, than on the Word of God. Therefore, many things were uncertain when it came to the scribes and the Pharisees because they were using tradition. But Jesus relied solely on the Word and authority of that Word of God that He Himself had inspired prophets to write in the Old Testament. And so as this Word was spoken and the way in which it was spoken, the people perceived Christ as having authority. And then Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4 makes this point even clearer. It says, but he answered, Jesus answered as it concerns the first temptation. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but how shall man live? This is how much authority the word has. But man shall live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In other words, how much authority does the word of God have? It has such, so much authority that it is to govern our entire lives. That's how much authority it has. And by the way, who has God, who has Christ now left with His Word? His church. Friends, what gives the final remnant, God's church in the last days, such authority in the last days is because they are proclaiming the Word of God. They stand true to every principle in that Word that we must observe. They allow the Word to govern their entire lives. And the result is, they are seen as, one, as people with authority, as a movement with authority, a heaven-ordained movement having ultimate authority with them, the authority of the Word of God, which would then include the law of God, right? Because that law is found written in the Word. So hence, these people, as we read before, they keep God's commandments. So this is powerful, friends. They have the law and the prophets, the Word of God, the Old and the New Testament, and they stand upon that Word, even if it costs them their lives. Now, not only do they stand upon the Word, but it says this movement illuminates the world with its glory. And friends, if it's a heaven-ordained movement, if this angel is coming down from heaven symbolizing it's coming from the very presence of God, that means, friends, the glory that this movement illuminates the world with is none other than the glory of God Himself. And friends, what is that glory? We found out in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18 previously that Moses asked God to see His glory. Then we, fir we went forward in Exodus chapter 34, a chapter later, when God finally reveals His glory, we saw that instead of just revealing the light that emanates from His person, He revealed His character, showing us that the glory of God is His character. But all of those characteristics mentioned in Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7, summed up in one word, is found in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, where it states, He that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? For God is love. Therefore, all of the characteristics of God, summed up in one word, is love. Therefore, the glory of God is the character of God, which is the love of God. And friends, where do we see that love? Because many say, okay, Akeem, I understand what you're saying, but, but how does love look like? What does it look like? I mean, I have to see it so that I can, I can seek to follow it, follow that pattern in my own life. Friends, when it comes to God's love, we read in a powerful text in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, we see that love encapsulated. And this is crucial for us to understand this scripture. For friends, we will see what the glory of God really equals in these last days. So go with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And let's see what constitutes that glory, that character, that love when it is finally revealed. 
Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And there we read in this scripture, But God commendeth, that means demonstrates, His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what does the love of God look like when finally demonstrated so we can see it? It looks like sacrifice. Therefore, this final movement of Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1, as they go forth with the message of God for these last days, what do they then manifest? They manifest God's glory. But you remember the glory of God is the character of God, which is summed up in one word as the love of God, which is revealed in the cross of God, the cross of Christ. His sacrifice was the ultimate demonstration of love. Friends, as we look to Calvary, we see what love is. And that self-sacrificing principle that Christ exhibited on the cross, and even before that, throughout his life, but climaxing at Calvary, this is what this final movement demonstrates. Do you see that? The final movement, therefore, Revelation chapter 18, experiencing the revival of God's love, they go forth uplifting the cross before the entire planet, showing people the love of Jesus Christ, not only in proclamation, but as a demonstration in their own lives. People see the self-sacrificing principle of Calvary at work in them. Friends, people see them giving of their time, their resources, giving everything in order for the salvation of souls. And friends, as they see that love, men caring for their fellow man, friends, it impacts the entire world. It illuminates the entire planet. So do you see what Revelation 18 and verse 1 is revealing to us? It is revealing to us the uplifting, the final uplifting, not only in proclamation, but in demonstration of the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross is part of this final message. Now, friends, once this self-sacrificing principle of love is demonstrated, people will want to listen. You've heard it said before, people don't care how much you know unless they first know how much you care. Friends, as this final demonstration of Calvary is given in the lives of the saints, it reveals to the world how much God's people care for the citizens of planet Earth. And it touches the heart. And so in light of that, this is what I want us to look at here. This is how we know this is connected without a final out, with a final outpouring of the Spirit. If the love of God is unleashed like never before in the manifestation of the cross of Calvary, that has to mean then that the Spirit is poured out as never before at this time. Why? For it is the Spirit who dispenses the love of God into the human heart. For as it is written in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, and hope does not make us ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So if this is a final demonstration of God's love that is given to the entire world, it must mean that we now receive an extra unction, more of a free outpouring of the third person of the Godhead, meaning he is more in control of the lives of those who he's working through than ever before. And friends, as this happens, this is the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit resulting in the final revelation of the love of God. Because where is it found? In the hearts of those who are giving the final message. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Therefore, as the love of God dwells in the heart with the Spirit who produces that love, it results in the unleashing of the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the saints. But friends, as we saw before, this is in opposition to the work of fallen evil spirits. The Holy Spirit and holy angels, who are also spirits, working against the devil and fallen angels who are evil spirits, opposing 
spirits, the unleashing of opposing spirits. Now, following this manifestation of Calvary, as men see now in the lives of the saints that God loves them, and the love is so rich, and it is demonstrated to, su to, su to such a deep point, friends, do you know what happens? When men then realize that we care, they are then willing to hear the next part of the message. And this is so beautiful because it shows that God doesn't just come to people and say, hey, get out of the system. No, what he does is he gives them a demonstration of love and care, ministry, medical missionary work, care and love for the people is first shown. And then the call is given that we're about to read in Revelation chapter 18, verses two and three, where it states, Revelation chapter 18, verses two and three, it states there, and he cried, this same mighty angel, he cried with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the dwelling place, the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That's just saying it's filled with devils. The complete filling for all nations. Why did this happen? Because all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings, meaning the civil leaders of the earth, have committed fornication with her, and the merchants, those who have power over the riches of the earth, are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. What are we seeing here? What we're seeing manifested is that Babylon, the papal system, and also her daughters, the apostate Protestant churches, in the United States and ultimately spreading forward into the rest of the world. Babylon is so completely fallen at this point that the fall is complete. They have fallen so far into apostasy that by this point, they are filled with demonic activity. The demonic activity is so full that it is perfect. Friends, this is perfect evil filling these movements. And so as this happens, friends, this is so deep what we're looking at here. There's coming a time where the papal system, along with the fallen churches, will be so filled with, en with the enemy of soul souls, so led into apostasy, that, friends, it's going to be really, really bad. It's going to be so dark that, friends, what is God going to do? I'm going to read to you a, a few statements before we get to that point, however. This is found in Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 68. It says the whole chapter, that's Revelation 18, shows that Babylon that has fallen is the churches who will not receive the messages of warning the Lord has given in the first, second, and third angel's messages. They refused the truth and accepted a lie. They refused the messages of truth. Another statement goes as follows. This scripture, Revelation 18, and in connection with Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8, it says this scripture points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon as made by the second angel of Revelation chapter 14 is to be repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon since that message was first given in the summer of 1844. A terrible condition of the religious world is here described. With every rejection of truth, the minds of the people will become darker, their hearts more stubborn, until they are entrenched in an infidel hardihood. In defiance of the warnings which God has given, they will continue to trample upon one of the precepts of the Decalogue. You can take a guess as to which one that is. Until they are led to persecute those who hold it sacred. Christ is set at naught in the, con in con in the contempt placed upon his people. So friends, what are we seeing here? We're seeing that, okay, the revelation of the love of God is revealed to the world. And in light of that revelation of love now, Calvary uplifted, 
what takes place next? The next thing to take place is that God, through those same people by which he reveals his love, shows that Babylon is completely fallen, filled with demonic activity. And in light of that demonic activity, Babylon reaching to this low point, there is a call to come out. You know, it's interesting. We find a parallel of this in the Old Testament, even in the days of Jeremiah. Similar statement to what we're going to read in Revelation 18.4. But I want to read this statement to you in Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 6 and 45. It states here, Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. My people, go ye out of the midst of her, and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. A similar message is given in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4. With the complete fall of Babylon, God now calls his people to separate from her midst to separate from this system. This, friends, I like to call the final exodus. It is the final exodus of God's people out of this system of deception. In quote, the final, before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, we read here, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children. At that time, many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted or taken the place of love for God and his word. Many, both of ministers and people, will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. That's why in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4, we read there where it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Friends, one of the final statements I want to read to you, the previous statement was from Great Controversy, page six, uh, 464. But I wanted to finish off with this statement. But God still has a people in Babylon. And before the visitation of His judgments, these faithful ones must be called out, that they partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Hence the movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven, alightening the earth with his glory and crying mightily with a strong voice announcing the sins of Babylon. In connection with his message, the call is heard, come out of her, my people. These announcements, uniting with the third angel's message, constitute the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. Solemn thought. The situation of this, the situation of the world at this point sets the stage, by the way, for the mystery of iniquity to personify itself and for the ultimate coming collision between the two mysteries. This is what we will cover in our final two presentations. Friends, this is crucial for us to understand. As we look into our world today, some of these things seem like they can never happen. But friends, this time is coming where through the work of fallen angels, Sunday will be raised again as a major issue in the world that because it has been desecrated, this has resulted in the moral decline that is taking place within society. The result will be that this will become the major, this will be pushed in a major way by the fallen Protestant churches in the United States of America to the point that they will then take hold of the civil power in order to raise Sunday and put it on a pedestal to the point that it is legislated. And those who go along with that legislation 
will receive the mark of the beast. However, there will be another group that says we will not go along. Instead, we will receive the seal of God, which outwardly is manifested in the sign of the day that the Creator has sanctified, the Sabbath, the seventh day, a symbol that in our hearts we have settled into the truth of God's Word. As these two days are raised up, we will see a revival, a true revival and a false revival. And the false revival preceding the true revival being instigated by fallen angels, that men may be deceived so that when the true revival comes, they will not want to accept it. But friends, the glory of God will be so overwhelming in this world through the saints in the last days that many will receive the messages that come forth as a result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these last days. My prayer is that we will stand among those who will walk with God at this time, that we will walk with Him now, that if He should so choose that we should live to this time that is coming, we will follow Him then. May we be found faithful with each and every moment that goes by, friends. For today prepares us for the future. With that, if this is your prayer, then I ask you to bow your heads with me as we conclude this message. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. And thank you for giving us so much light that we need not walk in darkness. We thank you that as we follow Jesus, the promise is given to us where Jesus says in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We thank you for the light. I pray that we will walk in that light and that Lord in turn, that light will affect us to such a point that we reveal that light to the world. Help us to stand faithful today that we will be able to stand faithful tomorrow. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oh,